Hi everybody, Eddie here. I'm really happy to see you all and it's been really fun reading some of your assignments. You guys have great ideas and I'm excited to read more. Um, I'm going to be talking about Roland Barthes' Grain of the Voice and also Michel de Soto's Walking the City in this lecture. And these are going to be two really important texts in cultural studies in general for anybody who wants to continue down that path. And so I'm really glad um, to actually be sharing this stuff with you because I love both of these essays a lot. And I love Barthes especially, and I love Surtout. Uh, quick reminder, uh, remember guys, you guys are doing great with your discussion posts and your sound journal, but you got to keep doing it every week, one sound journal and one discussion board post. The discussion post board posts are for participation, so even if you don't have much time, just try to submit something before the deadline because you're essentially going to get marks for it. And same with the sound journal. We understand when you're busy, you can't submit your best work, but we want you more than ever to get the marks um, when you can, right? And if that means, you know, recording whatever, you're recording two minutes of something and then just doing a quick write-up, that's going to give you some marks which are going to make a difference in your final grade so uh, again there's no judgment we're not uh, we understand if you get busy but this kind of regular posting and submission of your discussion boards and your sound journals are gonna make a big difference for your mark and we really want you guys to get the marks anyways uh i'm gonna talk about arts right now and then in the next short video i'll talk about Serto, and then finally i'll talk again about Barthes, but at a much shorter uh, time frame. Uh, so, and mm, yeah, Simon 2 is also going to be up soon. So look after that. Look out for that. That's going to be covering modules 5 to 8. And I know you guys will have a lot of fun because there's going to be creative options. Actually, all of the three options for the assignment are creative. So you're going to really combine the theoretical with the creative here. Anyways, today I'm going to talk about Grain of, Grain of the Voice by Roland Barthes. And this essay is from his early work, which many people associate with the movement called structuralism. And you'll read one of his later works when you read passages from How to Live Together. And you'll actually notice how different the two are. You'll see the dynamicism of Barthes' work and this sort of comparison between his early structuralist work and his early phenomenological work. But I also hope you'll start to see the ways in which his early work, uh, Grain of the Voice especially, already contains a lot of the phenomenological and poetic aspects we consider in his later work. But anyways, let's, let's start here in the Grain of the Voice. What is Barth trying to say? What Barth is trying to do is throw under light the tendency to describe music in adjectival terms, right? He lampoons how ho hollow the ways we speak about music are. As he writes, quote, How then does language manage when it has to interpret music? Alas, it seems very badly. And I think I'm going to figure out a quote system where I just put the quote on the screen. So you'll see this in the post-production. Anyways. Uh, if we think about what that means, you know, music um, is put into language very badly. What could, how can we understand that? And one way to understand that is to look at music criticism or, or even music analysis, right? When we read a description of music, it feels sometimes so shallow. If you, any of you guys read Pitchfork, I'm sure you're, you know the experience of reading uh, album review of an album you either like a lot or dislike a lot or feel neutral about but you just read the review and you're like wow this just does not capture the album at all like, trying to write about it just completely misses the point of it and even for those who know how to read music and know the basics of music theory you can see how the idea of dynamics themselves are bounded up by the adjective right terms like the Allegro, Presto, and Dante. Music is described in terms of the emotions it stirs up or through the reference to some kind of adjectival form, right? So 
you know, you can, if you can recall people talking about music, formally they'll say something like, yes, part B of the song is faster than the other part. But this kind of analysis, this analysis of form or this analysis of from adjective is quite lackluster compared to the actual experience of listening to music. So for Barthes, this rendering of music entirely as an adjective ultimately has a function. And what is this function? He writes, uh, the man who provides him, oh, sorry, the man who provides himself or is provided with an adjective is now hurt, now pleased, always constituted. That is to say, to talk about music as an adjective is to constitute us as a certain kind of subject. And so in that way, talking about music as an adjective protects us from the desubjectivizing potential of music. So if our social world, insofar as language is the social experience of, you know, our social reality of music is bounded by how the form is, you know, impressive or how the, how the piece itself made us feel happy or sad, what ends up happening is we really restrict the ways music can actually break us down and transform us. And I'm sure all of us who love music know the way that music has this entire powerful sway in our lives, right? Like the ways we can disappear in a great song or the ways we dissolve in a melody. And like after we listen to it, we suddenly just become new, anew. There's a great power in music. Anyone who's very close with music knows. And this power is often being missed when we actually talk about music. And in part, again, it's because of the adjectival framework to talk about music. The adjective pins down music into a constituted subject or a rather simplistic constituted subject. Um, so Nietzsche has this idea of the Dionysian and the Apollonian. And I would argue that Barthes, who has been on record and documented as a great admirer of Nietzsche, actually would posit music to be a Dionysian ideal. And so what does that mean? For Nietzsche, the Dionysian is this chaotic, imageless, musical, and intoxicating state of mind, right? The Dionysian emerges through the collapse of our egos. It describes the state where the cognitive forms of the world break down. And so in that respect, the Dionysian is the sort of bursting forward of an intoxicating reality, which ends up annihilating the individual. And so the Dionysian is ultimately this breakdown of, a, of our world of appearances and a breakdown of the borders between the individual and the world. And in this breakdown, there's just this intensity and this intense pleasure, uh, which ultimately comes at the loss of a self or an ego death, uh, annihilation of the usual limits of existence. So we could say the experience of listening to music would be this kind of Dionysian ecstasy where we disappear into the music and our sense of self evaporates in the movements of the song, becoming one with the music. And so the pleasure of listening comes from letting our mind disappear into the music and letting our body disappear into the instruments. So When we, however, bound our experience and linguistic experience of music to adjectives, what ends up happening is we limit music to the realm of the imaginary, to coded forms of understanding. Put again, the adjective allows for an easy conception and evaluation of music. It doesn't really force us to really wrestle with a text, right? Music criticism almost makes music easy. Well, bad music criticism. Good music criticism should open the text. Um, and obviously there's a part of music which, you know, is social, linguistic, and imaginary, which is, you know, all music in part has this adjectival quality, but the sort of adjective equality has so much sway in the discourse of how we talk about music. And so the solution to this facile, lack lackluster mode of talking about music is not to reject the adjective for Barth, at least, because that's not actually possible, right? Because we're still going to be bounding our language surrounding music to the adjective only in neg a negative sense. Or put another way, it's not possible unless we propose an alternative. And this is what the grain is, right? 
Barth wants us to bring our focus to another aspect of music's relationship with language, and and this aspect is what the grain is the grain. So as Barth writes, it would be better to change the musical object itself as it presents itself to discourse, better to alter its level of perception or intellection. Put again, it's hopeless to resist our intuitive adjective response to music. Instead, we should change the way we present the musical object. We can do this by changing our perception of it. And in this way, we could say that the grain is a new way to speak about music. It provides an alternative to the adjective. And, you know, very quickly, we should remember that the soundscapes which you will be making, you know, for their second assignment, and also the sound you encounter in everyday life, these are still music, right? So Barth was writing in the time where he was talking about music in the sort of traditional sense, but in our post-John Cage world, as we've learned already on non-idiomatic music, is that we can say everything is a kind of music. And this was a topic in your first assignment, if you guys recall, right? When we speak about grains, we also suggest a new way of speaking about sounds in general. So, and actually Barth says as much as of this at the end of the essay, he writes that the grain or the lack of it does persist in instrumental music. There is an aspect of language to the grain, but even in the case of non-linguistic musics, there's also the grain there. And you'll see later what that exactly means, but for birth it means very simply uh, that the grain in non-linguistic music, music without voice, is often noticed in the body movement of the source of the sound that end up producing the grain. So anyways, the grain for the most, for most of the essay ends up being a different space in our listening practice, which shifts our normative relationship between language and music. So it reinvents the way we can speak about music. And how does it do this? Well, for Barth, there's a sort of duo gesture of the grain. He writes that the grain is the materiality of the body speaking its mother tongue. And what that essentially establishes are two core terms in the grain, the body and the and language, right? So the grain is something ultimately which resists normative semantics and ends up rewriting or ordinary semantics. And we're going to take this idea of rewriting ordinary semantics up more when we talk about Sirto, but it's important that to establish that Barth does something here too. And so on the one hand, that's what the grain does. On the other hand, it also ends up creating a language around sound and music grounded on the body. Um, so rewriting ordinary semantics semantical meaning of a work and creating an alternative of thinking about a work through the body. So in the essay, Barth compares two different composers, uh, Fisher Daisake and Panzera, and he refers to Fischer as FD. And so FD is acclaimed, but Barth is actually quite indifferent to, while Panzera is largely forgotten and you can't really actually hear much of his recorded works now whereas FD you can hear a lot of it um, but he Barth adores Panzera and Barth explains that FD lacks the grain of the voice um, while the composer Panzera has a voice that is littered with grains and why is that uh, because the wear of a language, because it shows the wear of a language that has been living, functioning, and working for ages past, that there may be simply the springboard of the admirable vowel. So for Barth, there, lay the, there lays the truth of language um, in this type of work. So the truth of the language is not its functionality, clarity, expressivity, or communication. Instead, this, the, vo the voice of of the grain end up exploring language as a complete bodily experience that could go beyond the normative signification of music, music as language. 
So, but again, instead of just sinning to express an idea, uh, there's now this way of sinning which expresses something outside of the realm of ideas, out of neat linguistic categories. There's a fluidity and messiness to the grain, which Barth really likes in uh, Pinzira. Uh, and which, honestly, I also really like in the work of many outsider musicians. And I hope you guys like in a lot of the music Ben uh, explore. Uh, but the point is, sorry, though, that this new way to evaluate music resists the idea of music evaluation based off technical aptitude of a claimed composer or have you not, right? One can lack technical skill, but you can make it up for it by having a grain or you know what we see as a grain. So the mastery of a work that lies in discipline has no bearings on the grain. The grain is just this totally new way of evaluating music, not based off technical aptitude, but based off well, what's it based off? And here Barth describes the grain as something that is pre-semantic before style and form and in the movements deep in the body. As he writes, the grain is beyond or before the meaning of the words, their form, the litany, and even the style of execution, something which is directly the cantor's body, brought to your ears in one and the same movement from deep down to the cavities, the mumble, muscles, the membranes, and the cartilages, right? So put again, the grain is something felt out in our body. It's, we can modulate Nick's statement that thought occurs in the mouth through Barth's paradigm by adding that for Barth, the mouth is not only where music is produced, but the whole body. Music occurs in the teeth, the mucous membranes, the noise, the nose, the tongue, the noisy no, nose, I guess. And when one sings or makes a sound with the grain, what they're doing is putting their whole body in that act of sound making. And the grain is making ourselves attuned to this whole bodily gesture. So ultimately, Birth adds that the grain... Um, well, anyways, Birth adds that the grain is not just the timber of a sound, but that its significance cannot better be defined. Uh, the significance it opens cannot better be defined, indeed, than by the very friction between the music and something else, which something else is the particular language and no wise the message. Put again, it might sound like the grain of a, the voice is just the texture of the voice, the unique character of the voice, but it's also more than that. It's a way of engaging in music beyond the message, beyond the idiomatic, right? It's non-idiomatic as we've talked about prior in Ben's lecture. Right? So this way of engaging music beyond the message has its ground in the body and in embodiment. So in Fan's lecture, we, un we started to understand the ways that affectivity is a way to dismantle the regime of idio the idiomatic meaning. And also, it's also a way of dismantling the regime of the adjective, right? Because the, the affect is pre-linguistic, right? Uh, the, the skin is the skin is faster than the word, as Masumi would put. And in being pre-linguistic, what affect ends up doing, and what the affect which the grain is attuned to ends up doing, is producing a counter language, right? A counter sociality from the normative way of understanding music and sound, right? So there's so many examples of grain, the grain in music, and you can just pick your favorite musician who has a sort of strange voice or texture that maybe your friends don't understand. But, you know, there's Bob Dylan in the 60s who famously had a poor singing voice, even though he's improved then. There are people like Nico, Can, Joanna Newsom, And Joanna Newsom's actually a great example because one, she has this very unique voice, which we can say is has sort of this grain, but also her harpsichord playing uh, is famously quite unique, but also a lot of professional harpsists say she doesn't actually play it that well. But that almost doesn't matter, because the way she 
embodies the movements of the harpsichord. Uh, the weight is more in uh, the bodily gestures and the sonic relationship with the grain than actually technical skill, discipline, uh, mastery, right? Um, she's a very grain focused musician, at least to me, you know, and for, you know, to fan most certainly too. Uh, who you know adores Joanna Newsom. If you ever want to talk to him about that, go go for it. He'll you know he'll give a whole lecture on that stuff. But anyways, another way into understanding the concept of the grain is through the idea of the phenoson and the genoson, which Barth devotes a section of his essay to. And so, in summary, Barth is quite resistant to the idea of the phenoson, but advocates the genoson. And so. What are these two terms? Essentially, the phenoson are the technical aspects of a musical performance, right? It's all the phenomenon, all the features which belong to the structure of the language being sung, the rules of the genre, the coded form, uh, the composer's dialect, the style of interpretation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In short, it's everything in the performance which is in service of communication, representation, expression, everything that is customary to talk about, which forms the tissue of cultural values, the matters of acknowledged taste, of faction, and critical commentaries. So basically, the phenoson is the cultural meaning of a work, as well as the formal meaning of the work. The phenoson is everything in the work that can be analyzed and discussed in terms of the adjective. The phenoson is adjectival thinking about music. The genoson, on the other hand, is the embodied affective side of music. It's the space where, quote, uh, the space where signification germinates from within language and in its, in its very materiality. It is a form of play, of signifying play, having nothing to do with communication, representation of feeling, expression, where melody explores how the language works and identifies with that work. It is in a very simple word, but which must be taken seriously, the dictum of the language. And here again, we see uh, these two duo terms which constitute the grain within language and materiality, embodied affectivity and the ways in which that embodied affectivity ultimately rewrite language. So we can honestly think about uh, the genoson and the phenoson almost uh, in terms of affect versus emotion, which we touched, which Van talked about last time, right? So affect is pre-linguistic, is totally embodied, while emotion can be described through adjectives, I'm happy, I'm sad, etc. And it's tied to social meaning and um, cultural meaning and it's socially inscribed, right? Affect comes almost before all that. So in sort of channeling the affective and channeling the embodied uh, moments of music, what can happen is we can remode and represent a new type of meaning to the work, right? The normative meaning of the work does not have to be stuck in stone. The, the way to evaluate music based off the discipline of uh, text, the you know technical aptitude, the ways it follows certain genres. This doesn't matter, right? Uh, a musician or a sound can just sound really weird, but if it has a grain, it can really touch us. It can it has a lot to offer us, right? And you know the Gino song is what Barth advocates is the site in which music brushes against language where one's voice explore, explores the textures and tricks of language the the Gino song is the grain it's the body of the voice the way things are articulated in a full embodied way and material matter right that's and that's that's the heart of it. This total materiality, this total embodiment, changes our relationship with meaning from being purely semantic about literal or formal modes of communication to being something a lot more loose, granular, dependent on gestures that can't easily be translated. Right? It's not just about how a sound sounds. Almost, it's about how how a sound vibrates in our bodies. About how a sound makes us think differently about the English language or whichever language we're speaking about. It's about how music transforms and erupts and punctures our subjectivity. Right? Um, you know, there's been studies about how AI can compose songs that musicians can't tell apart from 
music that a human composed. And we could say in this sense that AI really would know how to replicate the phenosan of a work. The question is, of course, how do, would we replicate the genosan of a work? Right? And, you know, maybe it will be possible in a few years and stuff. But the idea is the genosan is beyond the discourse of mastery and discipline, while the phenosan is all about it, right? The genosan is a lot less um, organized, a lot less understandable. It's a, mo a lot more ephemeral, but you know, it's not. It's not unspeakable. It's not the sublime, untouchable thing. It simply is a new way of engaging with music and a new way which challenges and rewrites um, our normative understanding of it. So to bring this back to the Dionysian, uh, Barth speaks about the ways that the desubjectivizing nature of the grain also produces a loss in subjectivity in the discursive music. One loses the subject, their subject, in listening for the grain. The subject no longer says, I like this, I don't. Instead, just a totally new space of relating with sound emerges. So to close off, I want to talk about how looking at the grain puts forward a new mode of listening to the world, right? When we listen by grain, we end up listening to how sounds come out of the body and how this bodily emergence resituates language. It's a new schema of evaluation, which may be good, right? So what may be good in terms of the phenosan, in terms of the form, the conventions of of a song, have may have no interest in the grain reading, right? Maybe two poorly out of tune chords with a sailor wailing their heart out might have no merit for a phenosan uh, analysis, but it could be so rich in analysis if we're looking in the genosan or in the grain, right? But the idea is the judgments of good or bad means nothing when we view things from the point of view of the grain because the grain is beyond the adjective. At one point, Bert talks about how the space of the phenosan, the conventions and disciplines of music, belong to average culture, right? It's just doing something which has already been done before, which has already been codified. But this type of music is not ex offering anything other than expertise. And as a result, it's non-experimental. All it does is reinforces the norms of society, society, because society dictates the aesthetic conventions we want to follow. But to take seriously the grain and to listen to grains to make us, and also, as you guys might have fun doing, to make soundscapes with a ear attuned to the grains of a text is to resist the very aesthetic norms and conventions we find ourselves surrounded with. And in doing so, we are given new ways of being in the world. So anyways, I'm hoping that in talking about Barthes in this way, I'm giving you guys another way in understanding the work of listening and creating and also evaluating your creation and your peers' creations. And I hope this is going to be helpful for your future sound journal, soundscapes, and peer critiques. Because being able to listen for grain as opposed to technique and phenosan is just going to allow you to hear this new dimension to a musical work as well as to everyday sounds. Okay. And well, with this established, I'm going to move on to Surto. I'm going to move on to walking. And I'm going to carry on with this theme of sort of resisting the normative way things are done and rewriting the normative ways things are done. So I will see you guys shortly. Uh, yeah.